My name's Megan Cope. I'm a Quantum Walker artist from North Stradbroke Island. Um, I'm here for the water exhibition uh, with my work, Reformation Number 3, Nagoon, St Helena, um, has been included in the exhibition. Middens are usually located in places that have fresh water, they're out of the wind, perfect campsite. And it's where I want to align middens with architecture to say that these are hand-built forms that relate to the home and the site of people. At Moomba on Point Lookout, the Surf Life Saving Club is built on a midden. So, you know, you, we see one thing replacing another um, and erasing. So I started to research the lime burning industry on um, our country and it was a practice that was occurring um, throughout all the colonies um, because they hadn't been able to locate limestone to make cement for the foundations of the colony. So the lime burning industry was something that happened for a long time on the east coast of Australia and I think that when we um, understand what that industry did in terms of devastation, like we have to understand that in a very, very short space of time, all of our oyster reefs were completely decimated. There's a record there written down that the site of Dubba Gully, the site of the Sydney Opera House, that midden was 100 metres long and 15 metres high. So, um, you know, we can imagine then that middens before they were mined were the same size or scale as modern buildings. Um, not, not high rises, but you know, seven storeys perhaps. There are still places in Australia that are remote and you know, their middens remain intact and they weren't mined. So, mm. you know, we know that that's um, what was on our country as well. And there, there are photographs from the 60s of middens that are enormous shell piles, you agree, middens, colonisers resorted to scraping live oysters off the rocks on the oyster reefs that our ancestors had built. Um, but not only that, to fuel the kilns, there was immense tree cutting and stripping of timber to produce this material to make concrete. Um, and that to me is what we need to think about. But we don't know about like the devastation um, that has happened just with this looking at the oyster. Humble little mollusk and the history of that on country, you know. So that's what I guess these middens are attempting to do. So it's really important that that line work is visible. We also kind of have to do that because of the way um, that the shells need to interlock because we're building from the ground up. Um, I guess as we're working away, it's really important to think about those timelines in the landscape and seasons and how middens form themselves, you know. Obviously there are other factors that come in there, like long periods of time and seasons that aid the compacting of the shells and then the sand and um, the weather and all of that then brings it together. But with this work, replicating that visual form, Oyster shells are quite fragile because they're thin. When they interlock themselves, that's where the strength comes because where it seems to interlock is, I guess, the greatest volume in the shell. I think there's about 12,500 here. Yeah. The ones at the top absolutely rely on the foundation and the placement of every single um, oyster. This is what I mean about the dry wall kind of method methodology. Um, where, yeah, the oysters interlock. Yeah. You really have to be intuitive and, um, and you know, understand, like turn the, turn the shells around and move them along um, and allow them to tell you where they're gonna sit next, you know? Yeah. Our survival as the oldest living culture on earth didn't arise from or rely on um, the permanence of civilizations defined by Western terms, but 
our ability to know our country so intimately and to be able to read it and adjust. Yeah, the lime burning industry was one of the very first industries established because you think about the you know, foundation of the colony needing to occur um, to create that literal foundation. Um, you know, uh, yeah, you can look at old maps and you'll see that there's a lime burner's creek almost everywhere, you know, um, on river mouths, um, you know, the Hawkesbury, there's lots. Um, like here, um, yeah, every, everywhere basically on the east coast. Um, yeah, it's Lime Burners Creek, Lime Burners Road. Um, these are little um, keys, Clues, yeah, yeah, into the history of places. I mean, uh, oysters really, it, it is actually a really political um, um, food. Um, it was a food that um, people on the fringes who didn't have any money could eat and live yeah, off yeah. and you know it's yeah. really really important but you know the lime burning industry and then um, you know led to an immense shortage um, yeah. and then you know you've got to think also then about um, the the health of the waterways because this this little um, Kenyan Yarra, its job is to clean the, and filter the waters. Like, it was sophisticated aquaculture. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I know. And it's wonderful that Bruce um, Pascoe um, has, has done that for us so that we can reimagine um, and actually value um, Indigenous knowledges, um, yeah, in ways that Australia hasn't previously. You know, oyster reefs are essentially the foundation of all life in in the bay areas and river yeah. systems, like they're absolutely critical yeah. um, to provide like the nurseries and the homes for all the small creatures that then you know go into yeah. the big fish right up to yelling below the whales, you know. Um, and yeah, it's interesting to me that um, yeah, again, the colonial project needs to destroy something to create its foundation, and we're quite different in the way that we create foundations for life. Well, water does that. Water connects us more than it divides us, really, in lots of ways. The management is quite complex. Like, once they do get to a certain stage, like, the oyster likes to grow on this um, other, they like to attach themselves to this, oh, what's it called? It's like a um, pointy, pointy other shellfish, um, yeah. which we eat as well, yeah. um, but they like to coexist. Oh, kind of like, I yeah. guess like with this Walliga Lake the one, Lake. right? Yeah. So these two, they're friends and they grow yeah. together and they need each other for certain things. So I guess this, this periwinkle is the one that drags the um, oyster to other areas once it gets yeah. to a certain size, because the oysters can't move. Yeah. They only yeah. move when they're spat. Art for, um, many Indigenous peoples is not something that exists in, um, you know, the space of white walls and, you know, when our ancestors did it, they didn't do it to make muddy money. It wasn't a commodity. It's like directly um, connected to maintaining our culture and um, our knowledge systems in contemporary times that we need to return to that in lots of ways, um, but not within this ethnographic context or performed identities or prescribed notions of indigeneity like um, that space is sort of everybody's responsibility um, it's not just our responsibility to rebuild our country we were not the ones who destroyed it so this is now everybody's responsibility for me this work really needs to go to return back to um, practices of reef restoration. I think that I'm not, I'm less interested in seeing shell piles in the landscape and more interested in the reef restoration um, so that we can um, yeah, restore our ecosystems and have access to our traditional foods um, and also um, do our job as um, traditional owners that you know maintain country and look after country that's our cultural obligation so it means a lot to me um, to have this work come home and also this will be its keeping place you know that means a lot to me